Nigga, Royal Princesses, attack! Hey everyone, welcome to Vegan Warrior Princesses Attack. I'm Nicole. And I'm Callie. And today we'll be talking about... Today is our part two on our discussion on universal basic income. All right. But first, Callie's got some news. Yes. First up today is reported on Veg News. It says, Masa Meat to debut slaughterhouse-free meat by 2020, dated January 18th, 2018. So it seems like it is finally happening. This isn't just some far off pipe dream anymore. Uh, Food technology company Masa Meat announced that it will launch its first clean meat, also known as cultured meat product, in one and a half to two years. Mark Post, Masa Meat Chief Scientific Officer and Vascular Physiology Professor, uh, debuted the first clean meat burger. Uh, it costed approximately six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to create in two thousand thirteen in London. Speaking with Food Navigator, Masa Meat CEO Peter Verstrait revealed that the company's meat, which is grown from a small amount of cells in a lab setting, negating the need to slaughter animals, will first appear on the menus of upscale restaurants. It will be a statement, Verstrait said, not a commercial venture. The company plans to sell its clean meat product on a commercial scale in approximately three years when it is able to reduce production costs and receive appropriate approval as a novel food product from the European Union. Wow. (laughs) Wow, indeed. I just still don't know how I feel about this. Um we've talked about that many times but um the fact that it is so close to like coming out is is shocking i mean i know i don't know if they'll be the first um that's kind of the first date i think i've heard if i'm not uh, mistaken i know hampton creek is also trying to develop you know clean meat i.e lab meat um, but I don't know how far away that is. So, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what I think <laughs> about that. But it's going to be um, it's gonna be quite shocking when it's actually, like, out to see who's going to eat it, you know, and what it'll cost. Yes. Well, I do know what you're going to think about. Surprise twist. I have a news item. All right. <laughs> And Great I know that you're uh, segue. Be on fucking ten about it. <laughs> so, uh, listener Carolyn actually sent this to me a while ago. This one's a little old, um, and it was a really long article. And I just I kept meaning to read it, and then I didn't. Um, but I decided to. I had it on my notes as something I wanted to talk about, so decided to do it today. But this one was from The Intercept, uh, dated October fifth, twenty seventeen. So it's a few months old. Um, and I did go and look cause I don't know the intercept. I don't, I'm not familiar with the intercept to know like how reputable it is or whatever, but I did Google some of the details of this and found it posted on several other, um, sites with similar details. So I think that it's pretty, pretty on it. Um, anyway, the title is the FBI's hunt for two missing piglets reveals the federal cover up of barbaric factory farms. But I feel like it's a little misleading because I don't think it like delivered on that exactly because it made me think that they were looking for these piglets and then like realized how terrible the factory farms are. And that's not really what happened. (laughs) Anyway, so it goes on to say FBI agents are devoting substantial resources to a multi-state hunt for two baby piglets that the Bureau believes are named Lucy and Ethel. The two piglets were removed over the summer from the Circle 4 farm in Utah by animal rights activists who had entered the Smithfield Foods-owned factory farm to film the brutal, torturous conditions in which the pigs are bred in order to be slaughtered. While filming, the activists saw these two baby piglets lying on the ground, visibly ill and near death, surrounded by rotting corpses of other dead piglets. 
Um, so DXC um, was actually the one to go in and do the, They were doing the filming and they were the ones to rescue the piglets. So they decided to take them rather than leave them to die. It goes on to say, under normal circumstances, um, you know, a large company like this would never notice two sick piglets missing out of the millions it breeds. Um, nor should they care because a sick and dying piglet has no commercial value to them. But the rescue of these piglets has become literally a federal case because on the last day of August, a six-car armada of FBI agents in bulletproof vests armed with search warrants descended upon two small shelters for abandoned farm animals, Ching Farm Rescue in Riverton, Utah, and Love and Arms in Erie, Colorado. The sec- these sanctuaries have no connection to DXE or any other rescue groups. They simply serve as a shelter for sick, abandoned, or otherwise injured animals. The attachments to the search warrant specified the FBI agents could take DNA sem- samples, so blood, hair follicles, I shouldn't laugh, but it's just so ridiculous, blood, hair follicles, or ear clippings to be seized from swine with the following characteristics, and then they list some characteristics of the piglets which include any swine with a hole in the right ear. So again, I mean, first of all, they know they're piglets, but the search warrant allows them to do these things to any swine, like of any age, because the characteristics are just like pink, white coloring, docked tails, approximately five to nine months in age, and a hole in the right ear. So you're talking about a sanctuary that, serves as a rescue for farm animals like anyway so they searched the premises of both shelters they demanded dna samples of two piglets they said were named lucy and ethel in order to determine if they were the same piglets they you know i'm not going to go into details about it but they describe you know them taking the dna sample from the piglets and how the piglets were scared and they were hurting them you know they were not doing it gently or in the proper way Several of the volunteers at one of the shelters said they were followed back to their home by these FBI agents who questioned them in front of their family members and neighbors. So that all happened. And then there were events that happened after that seemed to continue what's basically like a government bullying of these sanctuaries. Uh, Weeks after the FBI's execution of these two search warrants, Love in Arms, um, the Colorado Sanctuary, received a phone call, I guess while they were being interviewed for this article, received a phone call from the U.S. Department of Agriculture claiming the agency had received a complaint that the sanctuary lacked the legally required licenses for animal shelters that are open to the public. They said, we had never had an FBI visit or a USDA call about licenses, and now suddenly within weeks both happened. So obviously they're drawing the conclusion that this is retaliation. Um... In general, you know, against DXE in a, like, indirect way, but it's also just a way for them to bully and frighten animal shelters into closing or not accepting any farm animals. This whole thing came about because apparently there was an article published in the New York Times after the rescue, which was talking about the virtual reality technology um, that's being used by animal rights activists to allow the public to immerse themselves in the full experience of seeing what happens. I think, did we cover that? I know the bearded vegans definitely talked about it. I don't know that we did. Okay. Yeah. There's this new virtual reality tool. So it's kind of like, you know, how they'll pay someone to watch a video. This one, like you can put this on and basically be in. Oh my gosh. Like a factory farm or be in like you could be in one of the um, people agree to do that i mean you know <laughs> so this is you know animal rights groups are really excited that this is a new tool like making what happens to animals even more real but the article that ran had a picture of the dxc members rescuing these two piglets mm. So because it got this press, all of a sudden Smithfield Foods was like WTF. Now now we got a show, like a show of force. <sighs> I'm, I'm just like... Mm. I'm literally so mad about this. I, I want to like break something right now. Yeah, same. <laughs> and then DXE didn't try to hide what they had done. They used it 
as a, a tactic known as an open rescue, and the purpose of which is to publicly detail what's been done to help the public understand the true nature of abuses and just make it, you know, so if something happens, it's all public so that other people know about it and can see, mm-hmm. like in this case, you know, the way Smithfield Foods has responded, it's now like a public right. issue that people know about. So anyway, um, the article goes on for a while, but I think we get the gist. Um, and just really for, for me, I wanted to bring this up. I mean, it's interesting on a lot of levels and I'll let Callie, you know, pick at any of those threads if she wants to. But for me, it's just this idea that again, this corporation who makes profits literally off slaughtering animals, you know, like killing the objectification of living beings. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, is able to use government power to intimidate and punish activists, to intimidate and punish places of refuge for these victims. And I just, I think, because I feel like sometimes even I forget, like, how fucking scary it is, how much power corporations have and how tied our, in they are to our military, our government, our law enforcement. They're able to mobilize these agencies of power against civilians and yet we most a lot of citizens can't get these systems to work for us even in clear cases where something wrong has been done like in cases when police officers murder people i i cannot fucking believe this story it's like that's why I had to Google it, because I'm like, this has to be fake. Like, this is too <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, the fact... Okay, like, this is... I get so... Fuck the police. Like, seriously. They are awful. Yes, all of them. All of them. As an institution... As an institution. They are fucking terrible. They uphold unethical and immoral rules they are the strong arm of corporations i mean we fucking saw this at the dakota access pipeline you had police officers abusing peaceful citizens all for corporate profits like this is fucking absurd like i cannot and you know what (laughs) Well, you know what really pisses me off about this story? What really burns your biscuits? Yes. Tell me. <laughs> Is that law enforcement, like the fucking FBI could mobilize to not only the fact that they terrorized people that they shouldn't have been bothering in the first place. Okay. That's bad enough. But they fucking put so many resources towards recollecting these two piglets. Tell me why you have thousands upon thousands of rape kits that are sitting in warehouses Ugh. untested Girl, because you won't spend the preach. money to test them, but you yes. will dr- DNA test yes. piglets on yeah, Animal you can get that in two DNA different states. Through? You're going to send six FBI officers to go no, after farm? six armadas. Oh, excuse like me. Like a, a six-car armada. Oh, excuse me. That's even worse. Okay, you're going to put all these people and resources, FBI resources, towards hunting down two piglets, which were discarded by the corporation in the first place. And would be killed upon return. This isn't even about the profits. This is about them fucking making a statement. And yet, they don't investigate our crime. Times. They fucking let rape kits go untested. They fucking let abusers get off. Like, mm-hmm. are you serious? This is where your resources go to piglets. The um, article. <laughs> so no, yeah. There's a paragraph in here that like backs you up. The article goes on to talk in depth about agag laws. It's very interesting. It's worth a read, especially if you're not super familiar with them, and just kind of draws the line of like how all of this stuff is. Uh, protecting the corporations and not the people. So it says, in other words, both the legislative process and law enforcement agencies are being blatantly exploited, misused to protect not the property rights, but the reputational interests of this industry. Having the FBI in the midst of real domestic terrorism threats, hurricane ravaged communities, and intricate corporate criminality send agents around the country to animal sanctuaries in search of DNA samples for two missing piglets may seem like overkill to the point of being laughable. 
but it is entirely unsurprising in the context of how law enforcement resources are used and on whose behalf. God. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) And then it goes on to say that there is a video taken um, by an investigator with the Humane Society in 2012 that shows their uses of gestation crates and that a lot of this is them trying to like you know, change the conversation and drop because they know people like the average citizen in the public doesn't pay attention to any of these undercover footage things. Like you may come across it and it may impact you, but it's not like it's on the nightly news. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just another way again, to keep it that way and to make it look like these, they're calling them like animal rights terrorists. They're calling these people terrorists are coming in, stealing their property, doing all this stuff. And they're using agag laws to like protect themselves from this footage coming out and to just change the public narrative because this is a funny story that would be covered on the nightly news. Maybe like, oh, the FBI is looking for two little pigs that got stolen from this company. So it's just like controlling the narrative, controlling the media, controlling the government, controlling law enforcement. Just fucking ridiculous how much power these companies have. I fucking companies that hate are this literally government so much. I know. It's like so the much. rage I feel like turning in my belly with stories like this. I just the the way we allocate resources is just disgusting. It's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. I'm like really impressed with this article because it's still going. <laughs> It was like a very well, it's like very in-depth, yeah. <laughs> well-researched, going into politics and all kinds of stuff. It's great. Wow. Um, but of course, that will be linked in the show notes. Definitely like recommend reading through it if if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a company that's literally built around death and exploitation, and they are able to mobilize law enforcement and a special like agency to come terrorize people like I would be terrified if the FBI showed up at my door Mm -hmm. you know that's that's terrifying yeah talking to like regular law enforcement is bad enough but then you're talking to people who can like ruin your life Mm -hmm. it's fucking horrible so anyway thank you Carolyn for sending that along I'm sorry it took me so long to get to it but it's um just a great example of a lot of things, but especially, again, just how much power corporations have in general and how I think as vegans and activists, like, it's just a reminder that we're up against this level of power and infiltration. Yeah. We're up against companies that can get the FBI to do their bidding. It's a big mountain to climb. Yeah. You know, I just think it's important to like not forget. Like we're not, it's just when we get in these conversations about like, oh, if everyone just like ate a little bit less meat, it's like, yeah, yes, I get it. You know, I'm, uh, I get it. Consumption needs to, well, people need to refuse to participate in this shit anymore and they need to be pro animal rights, pro animal liberation. Um, But, like, also this is the level of power we're dealing with. And this isn't going to be something that's going to be solved by just, like, buying coconut milk yogurt instead of dairy-based yogurt. Yeah. Well, I think we just – We we underestimate to our danger, like, how powerful the um, system is, like, opposed to our (laughs) – what we want, Mm -hmm. you know? And I just think we need to, like – Be very aware that these, there are like powerful forces out there. I mean, I hate to sound like a cheesy movie line, but like this, this shit is scary and it's bad. And this is not like you're saying something that can be solved by just like buying Gardein and, and shit like the corporations and what they're going to do. And like, this is why we were talking about a couple weeks ago, the whole like economic terrorist thing and why that's so fucking scary mm-hmm. that like people who disrupt corporate profits can now be labeled as terrorists and hunted down the way that like these people are. Well, and this is also why Callie most weeks, like a lot of times has a news item about some 
either dairy based corporation or, you know, meat or poultry based corporation buying or investing in vegan products and vegan companies because it's like this is the shit that they're doing. Yep. And then if we are only concerned about buying products that don't can don't contain animal products in them and then that's as far as our veganism goes we're still putting money in the pockets of these people they still have this power none of the power is shifted yeah we're just allowing them to continue to have this level of fucking power while we buy these little products that to them are just like this you know specialized arm of their company and they don't really fucking care Mm -hmm. and then they get to continue on doing stuff like this well, and it's just a good reminder too that like we all just need to um we just need to not forget how like dangerous this work is, you know? I mean, yeah. I mean, they're For real. Yeah. It's just we need to if you're not familiar with like security culture and just like trying to um you know, understand your rights And the way in which, like, the government can, like, really go after people. Like, you really need to look into it and not think that, like, we're just safe because we're, like, talking about vegan stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Like, we cannot underestimate this shit. God. God, that's fucking I think about it all the time. (laughs) I think about it all the time. Yeah, seriously. I'm not cut out for jail. (laughs) Right. I know this about myself. (laughs) Oh, I do not like authority. That would be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Well, good news item. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thank you. Our listeners are so amazing. They send us so much cool stuff and yeah. know so many things. Um, so, Kelly, <laughs> I almost feel like I don't want to do a joke. I'm so, like, <laughs> at the bottom of the well over that story. Right. Anyway, um what time did the man go to the dentist i don't know tooth hurty tooth hurty (laughs) (laughs) it's pretty good and you know why he was able to because he had universal basic income and had access Uh, to health (laughs) care So very good. Um, before we continue on with part two of our UBI episode, um, I wanted to talk about a little film called "How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days." <laughs> I don't know why I put myself through the exercise of watching this piece of steaming hot garbage, but I did, and did I figured. You finish it? I did. I don't know why. Like, I kept being like this. I kept, like, clicking out of it, and then I just kept playing it again. I'm like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Because it wasn't even bad enough to be enjoyed. It wasn't even, like, um, Next, like that Nick Cage movie I rented about, where it was, like, so bad. I was Like, my hatred was enjoyable. Uh-huh. This one was just, just bad, and it was just pissing me off. But, like, for some reason, I just kept watching. Because I was, like, I was just, like, what? fucking thing is going to happen next. Like, I just couldn't. (laughs) I couldn't let it go. So anyway, so this movie, spoiler alerts, if you haven't seen it, stars Kate Hudson and my all-time favorite, Matthew McConaughey. (laughs) And this was before they were dyeing his hair black. It was his, you know, natural color. Um, (laughs) And listen to the fucking premise of this movie. Okay, this alone put me on 20. I was like, fuck this fucking movie, but like also for some reason I'm still watching it. So the premise of this entire movie is that first of all, Kate Hudson, I didn't care to learn there. Oh wait, I do know his name was Benny. What was her name? I can't remember. Anyway, Kate Hudson's character is working at a woman's like fashion magazine and she's the how-to girl. (laughs) And so she does things, and then she tells people how to do them. But apparently, she has a journalism degree, and she wants to write about politics. It's one of those movies where someone's like, like, you can tell they don't actually understand how anything works that they're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) 
So they're like, oh, yeah, some bitch would go get a fucking journalism degree and be real serious about politics, but like end up at a fashion magazine <laughs> writing how to articles like how to um, I, what the fuck ever. I don't even know. Like how to do a facial with like your own poop or something, whatever they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, she wants to write real serious stuff, but her mean boss who wears very heavy red lipstick so that you know that she's evil won't let her and just wants her to do fluffy things and there's a this movie is literally dripping with misogyny like there's just so much misogyny every fucking female character is like a representation of some horrible stereotype that just makes women look awful so the boss is like this you know thin pale shrew who wears this it has like black hair cut in like a sharp bob and like wears bright red lipstick and like only cares about the bottom line, like has no soul. And then some of the other girls who are writers on the staff, like this one girl, they keep having her, she keeps pitching all these ideas and she's like, and it's in this really like, you know, um, shit, what does she keep calling it? She's like, but fun. Like everything she's saying is like, this article is like really fun, you know? So she's like this airhead who's just like, everything is like super fun. Just like everything about the movie is so atrocious. So anyway, we see like Kate Hudson's character is like real, real sad because she really wants to write important things with her journalism degree about politics, but she can't because she has to do these how-to articles. And then she has no idea what to do for her next one. She tries to pitch an idea. The boss doesn't like it. So then... She has her friend who's played by Catherine, Catherine Hahn, who like, I don't recognize her name, but I totally know who she is. And she's awesome. She's, I think she's from SNL and she always plays like these weird characters in movies and she's wonderful. So anyway, she, she was actually the best part of the whole movie because she was actually pretty good in a couple places. But, um, so her friend apparently is this woman who is quote unquote crazy and you know, dates men. So we meet her and she's crying because she just got broken up with. And we find out that she's been dating a guy for like a week. And she told him that she, um, when they had sex, like on the second date, she cried because it was so amazing and like told him that she loved him and he didn't say it back, but he didn't need to because she knows that he does. But then he like disappeared on her. So she's like devastated. And Kate Hudson's like, oh, you always do this. Oh, Kate Hudson's name is Andy because of course, because she's like the ultimate cool girl in this movie, by the way. Mm -hmm. So cool girls always have boy names mm -hmm. because that's how cool and chill they are. <laughs> Um, and that's not a, I actually like names like that for girls. They think it's super cute, but it's just like, of course. It's like a cliche right. for this type of character though. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so anyway, her friend, you know, her friend's just like crying and like such a mess and like everything she's saying is just ridiculous. Like she falls in love all the time and like, she's like, me like men always leave. I don't know why, but she's saying she does all these things that would be like giant red flags for anybody and just absolutely outrageous. <laughs> So Kate Hudson, like Andy, is like, oh, you know, you need to like play it cooler and like blah, blah, blah. And like she says what you're doing like would chase away any reasonable, healthy man, which I was like, that's actually spot on. That's actually true. But then her friend's like, well, they wouldn't with someone who looks like you. <sighs> because of, Ke of course, this person's the quote unquote ugly friend. But it's like she's not at all. <laughs> she's very pretty. Um and so Kate Hudson, like, they go into a pitch meeting and the woman doesn't like her ideas, whatever. But, like, so she ends up looking at her friend. Her friend ends up not having an article to pitch because she got broken up with and she's a mess. So she tells her boss that in the middle of this pitch meeting with all these other writers in the room. And then the boss starts making fun of her and telling her, like, she needs to get her shit together, basically, with <laughs> dating. And so Kate Hudson's character has this bright idea because she was like, use it for an article. And the woman's like, I'm not going to put my personal life in an... Like, I'm not going to use this for an article. And then she's like, well, someone else here should. Who's going to use it? So Kate Hudson's like, oh, me. And she was like, oh, why don't I come up with an idea of like, I'm going to do everything that women do wrong to chase a guy off and show like all the mistakes that women are making in dating. It's like, what the fuck? And then the boss loves it, of course, and she's like, you need to lose someone in 10 days. Anyway, 
Fast forward to Matthew McConaughey, who is an ad man, a generic ad man for a generic ad company, <laughs> who <laughs> they're trying to get this big diamond seller to be one of their clients. And so there's this completely nonsensical <laughs> situation where the fucking... So, okay, so first of all, we meet Matthew McConaughey's character when he is... Like, we're meeting, like, in the middle. He's talking to his friends, so we're, like, finding this out as they're, like, scheming and, like, trying to do this. So, apparently, two women in the company usually get assigned the, like, feminine stuff. So, the jewelry, the makeup, the et cetera, the bags, the clothing, et cetera. Matthew McConaughey, for some reason, decides he wants this. Even though it's going to these two women, he could do a better job, and he wants this campaign. Even though he usually does like the sports stuff and the the dude bro stuff, so but he, Nicole, it's fucking sexist that they're getting an opportunity. It is sexist that he is not. It is very sexist. <laughs> That's very true. He's just standing up for men everywhere who are being oppressed and being skipped over for opportunities yes. because women are taking them. Oh my god. <laughs> this is very I forgot how empowering this movie was. Right. I'm sorry. Um So yeah, they we show we meet him where he's scheming with his fucking friend to get this campaign away from these two women. And somehow it makes no sense to me how they all go out for this after work drinks and he's trying to pitch his ideas to win this campaign over in front of the two women he's trying to steal it from <laughs> and then the boss is like i don't know man you're a real playboy like you've never had a, even one day with a woman because apparently matthew mcconaughey's character just like bangs chicks and like kicks them out before <laughs> the morning even comes and he's literally never even like been on a date with someone so he's like, I don't know, man. I don't feel like you can sell diamonds to women because, like, you don't understand love and, like, you don't understand women. Matthew McConaughey's like, oh, yeah, I can make any woman fall in love with me that I want. And he's like, pick any chick out in this bar and I'll make her fall in love with me. And the boss is like, yes, this is a very good idea. <laughs> Very good idea. Yeah, this makes sense. This makes sense. <laughs> also, they never told us, like, why women are the target of this ad. Like, it doesn't... Because usually you target men. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you target both. But you're, like, trying to, like, make the guy think... Like, the guy's the buyer, is mm -hmm. my point. So, anyway, they're, like, talking about, like, women as if the woman's the buyer. It just was very weird to me. I'm like, that's not how this fucking patriarchal, heteronormative shit works. But, okay. So, anyway, they're like, you don't understand women. So, the... Yeah, but the women are supposed to be... Um, <laughs> giving blowjobs for diamonds. I know. Well, we're supposed to be convinced by the ads that the only way men show us they love us is by buying us these sparkly things. So then we nag the men that we love to buy us the thing. That's true. We are very good at nagging. We are. It's just nature. Yeah. It's science. I'm pretty sure it's part of our DNA. Oh, easily. <laughs> very easily. <laughs> so, yeah, the boss is like, okay. I haven't heard any of your ideas for the campaign itself, <laughs> but if you do this, if you, and the whole part of it too, is that the, the women who he's trying to steal the campaign from get to pick the woman that he has to make fall in love with him. Not the boss. No, but your arch enemies, like the people who are trying to make you fail are the ones who get to pick the person. It just makes no sense. If he gets, if he does this, the, the target, and of course, somehow it lines up that it's also 10 days. There's the company party for the kickoff to like woo the client. I don't even know why this party was happening because it's like, you don't have the campaign yet. <laughs> why are they having this big party? But anyway, they're having this big party. He's like, if you can bring this girl and I can tell she's in love with you, then you get the campaign. How does this make any sense? <laughs> It makes no sense. I don't get it. So anyway, these women had ended up being in a conversation. They had been at this magazine because, of course, the magazine is like getting in bed with this. Uh, they want the 
they want to buy adver- they want the diamond company to buy advertising with them so now it's like connected like oh this advertising company's uh purchasing ads in the magazine that she works for what a- and they both somehow happen to have this 10 day challenge like wow and end up at the same bar so anyway these women know that Andy's assignment is to basically be quote unquote crazy and drive a dude away <laughs> within 10 days. So of course they pick her because she happens to be in the bar as the girl that he needs to make fall in love with him and have a 10 day relationship with, which for him is like, OMG, how can I even do such a thing? But he's all cocky. He's like, I got it. So they end up dating. She does an escalating series of things that are just absolutely fucking outrageous. <laughs> absolutely outrageous. <laughs> and of course, you know, I just I remember the whole love burn thing oh from my that God. movie and it was just so fucking absurd. It was so absurd. Yeah. And it escalates to the point, this broke me. So it escalates to the point because she's like, oh, she's talking to her friends and she's like, I don't know what to do. I've done like every fucking crazy thing I can think of. And like the crazy, like I'm using that word because that was the point of this movie is to show how fucking crazy women are. It was so misogynistic. Yeah. Yeah, Well, so the first date, she was her cool girl self to reel him in. Oh, I yeah. She had to set him up. Yeah, which again made no sense. So she had to like to me. get him to like fall for her. Okay, and then she turns on him right. and becomes her like crazy female self. Right. Right. Where we see like her being all needy and emotional and doing all this like <laughs> absurd shit. Yeah, she does things like she he'll get home and he has seventeen messages on his voicemail. <laughs> And he goes, he starts playing them and it's like, hi, Ben. Hi, Benny. It's me. Hey, I was just wondering how your day was. Oh, I'm wondering if I can swing by later. I'm going to bring blah, 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 whatever. She shows up. So she's telling her friends, like, I keep doing all this shit. And he's like, not, I'm not able to chase him off. And um, her friends are like, well, you just got to go big. Like, you've got to do something like really hugely whatever. And so she, they were like, oh, are you seeing him tonight? And she's like, no. By the way, they've been seeing each other every single night, which is also just whatever. So she's like, no, he's got a poker game with his his friends. Like, it's like boys night. And she's like, they do it once a week. And so her friends were like, yeah, that's it. Like, you've got to crush boys night because that's the thing that men can't handle, right? So she comes in and she's just being a fucking monster. Like out of control, making a huge scene, being ridiculous to everyone. And so he like breaks up with her because he like finally can't take it. He's like, this isn't even worth it. Like you have to get out of here. Oh, she also called his mother. <laughs> oh, that's And right. made she, the baby album. She made that creepy baby <laughs> She was- I forgot that. She that made, was fucking terrifying. It was, but it was actually one of the funny things. Because I was like, if we're going to go this far, like, at least it should be this ridiculous. Right. She gets him a dog, yeah. which really, as, like, a vegan, pissed me off. So she adopts a dog and then puts it in this sweater. Again, this is all within a week. Yeah. Like, this was, like, within three or four days. Like, the fact that they've even seen each other more than twice is absurd. Yeah. <laughs> So this all happens, and so she replaces all of his toiletries with like (laughs) Vagisil, yeah, female cream, and he literally is shaking and going, "No, no, no!" (laughs) Because there's vagina stuff in his bathroom. (laughs) Oh my god! Oh, so the thing that really put me on ten, they're um, making out one night, and it seems like they might have sex. Do you remember this? Yeah. And. She calls his dick Princess <laughs> Sophia, and he loses his fucking mind. He's like, if you're going to name a man's member, you got to name it something hyper-masculine. <laughs> he actually said that. And he's like, oh, like Spike or Butch or Crawl the whatever... <laughs> 
Which ended up being what she named the dog that she bought him. (laughs) (laughs) And then she put the dog in a sweater and bought him a shirt that matched the pattern of the sweater. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yeah. (laughs) Oh. Oh, my God. So then he runs out to say his friends are like, no, man, you got it. Because they both work with him and they want to be on the ad campaign. So they're like, you got to save this dude. And he's like, oh, whenever my wife and I are having problems, like my wife threatens to leave me or whatever, I just suggest couples counseling. So he runs out after Kate Hudson and is like, let's I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Andy. Let's fix this. And he's like, let's do couples counseling. So she has her fucking friend pretend to be a therapist <laughs> and it was, that was actually really funny that was actually a great scene yeah. <laughs> Catherine Hunt is like so fucking funny and she just you could tell like she actually looked like she was laughing at one point and like yeah. how ridiculous well, and I liked how she was fucking was. with both of them she was fucking with both of them <laughs> so listen to this this put me over the fucking edge this is when I sent you the oh. Marco Polo and I was like what the fuck oh so so this all happens, right? Like, it's so bad. Like, he actually breaks up with her, but then he, like, is like, no, I need this job. I want to have this campaign. I want to make sure that I steal it from these women because I can't, I can't handle them having a niche where they actually are guaranteed income and job security. I have to take this from them. So he <laughs> suggests counseling. And then um, the in the therapy session with her friend who is fucking with both of them, the fake therapist, her friend ends up suggesting that he take her home to meet his family. And he agrees to it. So he brings this woman who has shown that she's very unstable, has zero boundaries, has an unhealthy, like unrealistic idea of what level of intimacy they're at. And like, (laughs) where their relationship is she does things to emasculate him which i don't know i have issues with even the concept of emasculating someone but and he's like yes the thing that i should do is bring her home to my actual real family and he doesn't tell his family anything about her like he doesn't tell them that this is happening he actually introduces her as his girlfriend Like, as this is, like, an actual relationship, and we find out he's never brought a woman home before, literally ever in his entire life. Because remember, he's never had any kind of actual relationship (laughs) in his entire life. (laughs) And fortunately, his family's really nice, and, like, they're, like, down, like, very down-to-earth people, you know? And so she doesn't do anything ridiculous while she's there she just acts like her normal self and then of course they like fall in love but then they get to the party this big party where it's like she's supposed to lose him by this day but he's supposed to prove that she loves him by this day and she decides that like she loves him and well she doesn't really decide that but they're like together and they're like doing whatever and her his boss comes and talks to her and decides that he can tell that she's in love with him like she he asks her and she's like no it's too early i mean no but then she does a little like well i don't know now i'm thinking thoughts in my little baby head and the boss is like I can tell. I know that she loves him. So she, he goes up and like claps Matthew Mah- McConaughey on the shoulder and is like, congratulations, sport. You did it. She's in love with you. You got the campaign. And then, of course, his friends, uh, the two women who like lost the campaign were like, oh, she must have been in on it. She knew she knew the bet and she was in on it and she was helping him. And his friends overhear this, so they decide to run over to Andy and say, oh, we know you were in on it. Like, they said, he's going to come ask you about the bet, like, tell him you didn't know anything. So then they proceed. Because now they're... what she didn't, Oh, and she didn't. So now she's all upset and pissed because now she's been used, right? Like, (laughs) hypocrite. And then, right, like you were using him, also. right? Of course, during this too, Matthew McConaughey ends up talking to Andy's boss, who knows him because they're there because they're one of the people they're buying advertising from, and she goes on and on and on about this fucking loser that Andy's <laughs> t- 
terrorizing with her behavior and how he hasn't left yet. And he must be so pathetic. And like, she called his dick princess Sophia and, and she just keeps talking. <laughs> it was just so fucking obvious. He was the guy. And it just, and then of course the dench is like record scratch, like, Oh God, that's you, you know? And so he's all pissed. So they end up going up on stage and having a very public battle airing all their dirty laundry to this entire room of people at this professional party. Well, while they're singing, you're so vain, which was very uncomfortable. (laughs) It was cringy. Like they're both up there, like actually singing it at each other, but like mad and then like saying shit. And I was like, this is a very uncomfortable scene. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then she decides Uh, She writes her article and then she's submitting it to her boss and she's like, so now I can write whatever I want. Right. And her boss is like, yes, whatever you want. And so she's like, really? I can write about politics. And her boss is like, no. And she's like, well, what about religion or like about the economy? Because that's what people with journalist degrees write about. And her boss is like, no, she's like, I mean, more like you can write about how to do anything you want. She's like, you could get into shoes. You could get into jewelry. Dream big. And Andy's crushed. She can't even believe it. She (laughs) sacrificed her journalistic integrity. And the love of her life. And the love of her life. (laughs) Don't forget that. Thank you. (laughs) To have this opportunity and she's not going to get it. She like can't even believe it. And she's like, well, thank you for making it easy for me to quit. And so she still writes the article, but of course it's different than they thought it was going to be. She talks about how she lost the love of her life because of these antics and whatever. And um, in the fucking, they show the article in the magazine and at the end of it, it's like, this will be my last article for this magazine, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no one would let you publish that. Like they do understand that there's editors and that like this boss, you know, this horrible woman of a boss would sign off on this stuff. Like no one's going to let you publish your resignation in this column because you realized how like horrible this whole premise is. Right. Oh my God. So anyway, she goes to leave to go. (laughs) This actually made me laugh out loud. She goes to leave for Washington because that's where she can write journalism stuff. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. It's just also cliche. Like she just couldn't go find. Like she's in a big no. city. Like she couldn't go find. No, because <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. I know, but it's just so... <laughs> um. So. In the meantime, Matthew McConaughey's friends force him to read the article, which he has no interest in. And then he realizes that, like, whatever. So he takes off after her. And of he course, realizes that the cool girl was oh, actually cool. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to say, <laughs> at one point, he actually said, what the hell's wrong with you? You were this, where's the cool, laid back, sexy, smart Andy that I met? Who's this crazy woman? That, like, he actually said cool girl. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So reading the article was a way for him yes. to realize, like, oh, number one, she fell for me. And yeah. number two, like, that was all, like, an act. Like, and she's that actually cool girl, chill. Yeah. Which is, like, thank God, you know. Right. Because, like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants a crazy bitch, that's for sure. <laughs> no. God, no. <laughs> um, They should all just die. <laughs> world would be such a better place without those shrews around right. fucking everything up so he goes um he goes to like her apartment but of course it's literally at the moment that she's getting into the cab to go to the airport for washington and <laughs> he has a fucking like crotch rocket you know i guess it's a motorcycle whatever um That was like, that was part of the whole thing was like her having to ride the motorcycle. So he gets on that and like follows her through traffic, finds her cab because he doesn't know what cab she is at one point, which is just so unrealistic. I'm like, then you like will literally never find her. Like you don't know where she is. So he finds her cab. He drives up next to it and starts pounding on her window and going, Andy, open the window, open the window. I need to talk to you now while they're actively driving. (laughs) And he's like violently pounding on the window. Like he's pissed at her. 
And I was like, this is not someone, this is not the right tone for like the end of movie romantic gesture. No, I disagree. He's it's very romantic. Yelling at her. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Men's anger is very erotic <laughs> for us women's. Um, <laughs> We're like so heavy on the sarcasm today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's full tilt. <laughs> I hope there's no like new listeners that are like, what the fuck? <laughs> I know. Like these are Sorry. all said in joking manners. Well, you shouldn't be a new listener because this is a part two. That's okay? true. That's true. So, I mean, I don't want to like critique your life because I don't know you. <laughs> but like if you start something in the middle of a part two of something, I just don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I was nagging you so you'd like me more. That's a tactic that people like Matthew McConaughey's characters use on women Mm -hmm. in the movies that he's in. So he um, basically, like, terrifies her into having the cab pull over so he can talk to her on a bridge, which I don't think things work like that. Like, all of a sudden, there were no cars around when it was, like, traffic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's very convenient because otherwise, yeah, you could not pull over on a bridge. She gets out. And she's like, blah, whatever, what? And he's like, did you mean this? And he's like holding the magazine. Somehow he's like had it this whole time. So he's like shaking the magazine at her. And he's like, was this true? Did you mean this? And she's like, yes, it was. Every word of it was true. And he's like, why are you going to Washington? And she's like, because I want to be a journalist. And he's like, why are you going to Washington? And she's like, because that's the only place I can write the things that I want to write. <laughs> Just like categorically, provably untrue. <laughs> like there's no journalist who lives outside of Washington. No. Okay. And he's like, why are you going to Washington? <laughs> and he's like, it doesn't have anything to do. He's like, Andy, you're running away. And she's like, no. And then she's like, yes. You know, <laughs> this is like a show in and of itself. Like watching you retell this is so, so good. fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And then they end up like making out. And of course, being like this great couple. Of course. Happy couple. Because that's the only place I can write the things I want to write. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. There's no nowhere else are things happening. Nowhere else do people hire journalists. The internet doesn't exist. Like, you couldn't just freelance and, like, sell your articles to people. Nope. No. No. You have to go to Washington. <laughs> and then she just immediately gives up what she was doing. Like, apparently yeah. she had shit lined up, and she just walks off with him. He throws... Oh, this also cracked me up. So he leans over in all of his masculinity to the cab driver because the cab driver is like, what's going on? And he's like, throws him like several hundred dollars. <laughs> he just like hands him this wad of hundreds. <laughs> and he's like, bring her stuff back to her apartment. She's not going to need to leave now or whatever he said. And he walks off with her so they can get on his scooter. And... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting there like, okay, so many things about this are wrong. First of all, the cabbie is like a person of color. Mm -hmm. So it's like just the whole like, it's like, hey, servant, go do this for me. I was like, why do you think this guy remembers where she lives? (laughs) It's not an Uber. Like he doesn't have, (laughs) he's not, he just picked her up and now they're, they're going somewhere. Like, why would he remember exactly where she lives and which apartment it is? Mm Mm-hmm. And number two, they had been driving for like five minutes, five to ten minutes. So like maybe, yes, maybe he can find his way back because they hadn't gone that far. But like he gave him like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And it was like her cab fare at this point was probably like 10 to 20 bucks. (laughs) So it's like I appreciate him tipping heavily, but it just also it seemed like the movie was doing it like, oh, this is what he would need to pay to get him back and it's like they just like (laughs) like they were just down the street why is he giving him so much money and why is he so adamant on getting this ad campaign if he has this much money to just like throw around on like ridiculous gestures yeah yeah 
And then, of course, they walk off and he does that thing that guys do where he, like, puts his arm around her neck. You know, it's like, this is my woman. Mm -hmm. And then they just saunter off to his little motorcycle to go back. Oh, and I think some, I think he had the fucking fern as well. Mm. I swear to God, I think he had the fern. And I was like, (laughs) how? (laughs) You're on a motorcycle. Where did you put it? It's this plant that's died. And it's this little fern. It's like it can't handle that. No. So ridiculous. Also, he kept the dog who he hated. That made me super pissed. (laughs) Not that I want him to like give it back, but like the fact that she adopted a dog as just like this way to like emasculate him and also like drive him bonkers was just like so gross to me. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Sorry for all the spoilers. It's a fine feature film. (laughs) Yeah. That movie was, yeah. The worst. Real, real shit. (laughs) It's so bad. Yeah. Also, Kate Hudson does not wear a bra through the whole thing, which is like more power to you. But it was just done in a very weird way. And at one point, they get splashed by this van driving by while she's wearing a white tank top. And I was like, I don't, like, this movie's made for, like, heterosexual women. I don't understand, like, why we're now seeing her whole nipples through her shirt. It was just very weird So the to boyfriends me. and the husbands of the women who dragged them to see the movie with them That's all I could something think. to entertain themselves with. That's all I could think. It was very, you could tell, actually, that's a good point. You could tell this was a, like, rom-com that they really tried to make for both Mm-hmm. sexes yeah they're like yeah we're gonna get the dudes in with matthew mcconaughey's character and talking about his member and like her little tits with the like water and no bra and then we're gonna get the chicks with like all the other stuff yeah and we're gonna show the chicks how to be cool mm-hmm. so the boyfriends they brought here will love them more <laughs> stay with them forever right yeah yeah it's true well, thank goodness for movies like that that Date teach night. us how to be good girlfriends. I know. It really served me well all of my years trying to be a cool girl. I mean, what else would we do? It definitely did not like ruin probably an entire decade of my life. <laughs> right. Definitely not. No. It it certainly made me a better person. <laughs> well, so anyway. Thank you for entertaining us with that. Yeah. That was quite enjoyable. Now we get to tap into... More heavy shit. Yeah. With UBI. Heavy but very interesting and very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last week, um, you know, we got into Callie was awesome and did a bunch of research and gave us a lot of information on what UBI is, some facts and figures around it, some information from studies that have been done. And then this week we um, are kind of digging more into sort of more cultural stuff. Um, talking more about attitudes around poverty and attitudes around work and people's places. We talk about mass incarceration. So we just get into kind of the smushier side of this, but um, probably more important in a way Mm -hmm. because it's the stuff that everyone uses as reasons to think that this won't work. So we hope you all enjoy and thank you for joining us again for part two. Yeah. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit more about poverty directly. Um, So it is three times cheaper to house people than to leave them on the streets. (sighs) Three times cheaper. I just... (laughs) Like, I felt like instant tears come to my eyes, and I already knew that, but I don't know. I was just like, I just can't. My whole body was just like, no. I know. Like, it's more expensive to let people fucking not have houses than to give them fucking houses, you guys. Yeah. Do you understand? Yep. A couple years ago, the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness released a study um, that basically said Florida residents pay about $31,000 a year on each chronically homeless person. So people that are like chronically homeless you know they've been homeless for many years thirty one thousand dollars a year the residents spend on 
the state having to care for that person. That includes um, police, mm. <laughs> salaries and expenses for locking them up for nonviolent offenses, which just makes my blood boil. Um, that includes paying for jail stays because... As again, we mentioned in our mass incarceration episodes, a lot of the income that's generated is from people who don't actually have money, you know, so it's like someone's homeless. So the police go arrest them and throw them in jail for the night and then they have a fine that they have to pay, but then they can't pay, which means more fines get tacked onto that and more and more and more fines until eventually then they go back to jail for not being able to pay the fines. And then they just sit in jail, not being able to afford the fines or pay the bail. So we're basically, we literally have just criminalized poverty. Like it's illegal to be poor, essentially. Mm -hmm. So the 31,000 includes um, policing, um, the jail stays, emergency room visits, um, and hospitalization, both like medical and psychiatric care for these people. Whereas the commission found it would cost only about $10,000 to literally put them in a house and assign them a caseworker of someone that would help them get back on their feet. So it costs us more to treat these people like criminals than it would just to literally give them housing. Um, also, this statistic, I'm sorry in advance, this one's going to hurt. There's five times more vacant homes than homeless people in this country. Wait. What? Yeah. That came out of a really amazing article. I'm going to have, we're going to have so many links in the show notes mm, here from yeah. all of these resources. Um, but I found this really good article um, on a website that's called a medium corporation, which seems really weird <laughs> um, or medium.com, but it's like the ABCs of basic income. So they go through, there's like all of these points and um I really highly recommend this because this deals with a lot of like the critiques of why a universal basic income wouldn't work. And it basically like refutes that with facts. And one of the things which was actually something I had worried about and well uh, as well was inflation and the cost of housing. Like I'm worried that if the government say gives everyone $30,000 um, that rental prices like housing will just go up to basically still make it inaccessible that people are going to want to make money. And this article refutes that extremely well, um, which I know is kind of a side point, but it basically was just saying that like, if everybody was making a certain amount of money and could afford housing, um, people that are, have housing to offer are going to want to be competing for those rental dollars because people, we think that free money means that people spend it more, but people are actually just as frugal with the money that is given to them than they are the money that they make. And so mm -hmm. people like, even if you're making, you know, 30 grand in the UBI, you're not going to want to spend all of that on housing. You're still going to want to get as cheap a housing as you can. That's true. So they're saying that like this will actually encourage like homeowners and like landlords to compete on lowering prices. Which would be nice because we need that. Yeah. We're going the wrong Real direction. Bad. Yeah. And it was in this article that it said there are five times more vacant homes than homeless people in the United States. So this re represents a large unused supply that need only be made available. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, and speaking of people being frugal with money that they're given versus money that they quote unquote earn, um, there was this really amazing TEDx talk by uh, Rutger uh, Bregman. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, it's really short. I think it's only like 16 or 17 minutes, but he lays out a really great argument for why universal basic income is the direction we need to go. He talks about how many like cities and countries around the world have actually done experiments to try to figure out how to implement a UBI. And the one that he chose to talk about, like actually discuss the details of was an experiment that was done in London in, I believe 2009. 
And they, they took 13 homeless men. It was a nonprofit organization that decided, like, you know, this we need to figure something else out. Um, it's costing the city. This was happened in the city of London. It's costing um, hundreds of thousands of pounds every year to, like, care for these people. Again, that in- involves, like, policing and hospital bills and just all of these programs that are not actually working to solve the case of homelessness. So this charity organization decided like what would happen if we just give these people money and some of these people had lived on the streets for like 40 plus years this is like in the financial district of london um that these like same people had just been like out living on the streets for decades some of them so each man there were 13 men in this experiment um received 3000 pounds cash no strings attached and counseling services were provided optional as a benefit um the only question that they asked of these people was what do you think is good for you and a lot of the people that were involved in this thought the same thing that a lot of the general public thinks about welfare programs and homeless people. And that's like, if we give them things, they're going to spend it on booze and uh, frivolous expenses, you know, luxury items that iPhones. they don't need. iPhones. <laughs> Avocado toast, maybe. <laughs> So they didn't have a lot of hopes that this was actually going to solve the problem. And what happened blew them away. So at the end of the first year, they found that these men ended up actually being extremely frugal. Um, They ended up spending on average only 800 pounds after the first year of the 3,000, which points to my point before about how like, we think that free money just means it's spent differently. But when people don't have it, they treat it just as carefully as they would, you know, having to actually earn it and work hard, you know, which is such a lie that we tell ourselves. Um, they spend it on things like a phone, um, education, um, housing. So seven out of the 13 had a roof over their head one year after they gave these people the money seven such a small amount of money seven out of 13 which to me says they probably needed like some clothes and somewhere to you know it just was like Mm -hmm. because it's such a small amount of money that wouldn't even pay a year's worth of rent I mean probably not even a few months worth of rent so it's like obvious that it just gave them what they needed to get to like the next level to do what they needed to do yep Two more people had applied for housing. Mm -hmm. Um, These men um, spent money on things like gardening classes, Mm -hmm. cooking classes, planning for their future. They ended up finding that this total experiment cost only 50,000 pounds. And that included like the salary of the caseworker who was involved in this. 50,000 pounds. And they saved... I mean, they completely changed the lives of at least seven people that had been chronically homeless for decades. This amount, 50000 this was cheaper than what the government usually spends by a factor of seven. Oh, my God. And there was a really good quote that um, the publication The Economist wrote about this. That says, quote, the most efficient way to spend money might be to give it to the poor. (laughs) Hallelujah. But like, how often do you hear like, oh, like you can't give homeless people money, like they'll waste it on drugs. Like we think that we have to make decisions for them. We think that we, that they don't know what's good for them, that they are degenerates or criminals or stupid you know, Mm -hmm. and these people know what they need. A lot of them just need someone to help care for them. Like they just need a little compassion and empathy and they can turn their lives around and to be given, to be empowered and just given some fucking resources. Yeah. Yeah. I loved, uh, one of the quotes from that Ted talk was, you know, poverty isn't a lack of character. Poverty is a lack of money. (laughs) 
And I was like, fuck. Like, yeah, obviously, but also nobody seems to agree with that or know that, you know? Yeah. It's so frustrating to me that so many people are opposed to a conversation about why capitalism is problematic. And we look at things like socialism or communism or programs and ideologies like a universal basic income as bringing out terrible characteristics of humanity, right? That we can't be trusted not to have to work for food. Like that that would be this downfall of society, right? That we would all be like lazy and not work and and we wouldn't be able to like keep society functioning and that people would fall into drugs and alcohol and we would just sit on our couches all day and watch TV and, and not be productive. And something else that this person talked about in the TED Talk was that like he said, if I go around the room and ask you all, what would you do if you didn't have to do the job you do now? He's like, probably 90% of you would have some idea of what you would like to do, some passion, some goal, something that you care about that you would like to be doing instead of the job that you're being forced to do. Yet, if I went around the room and asked the same people again, if they thought the other people in the room would not do anything If Mm. money wasn't a factor, he was like, 90% of you would say yes. He's like, so we know that for ourselves, if we didn't have to sell our labor on things we didn't want to do, that we would find other things that we would want to do. He's like, people actually want to contribute. We want to feel like our life has purpose and meaning and that we make a difference. Well, and doing something you're good at or that you enjoy gives you a fucking high. Right. It feels good. So he's like, we know that about ourselves. Humans just naturally seek that out. We're curious by nature. Yeah. And we naturally seek out, like, what is this? Let me try it. Oh, my gosh. I liked that. I want to do it again. Yeah. There's hardly anyone out there who didn't love something as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you just find it. And I was reading that kind of village structure used to be... More, actually, I think it might be in my Ishmael because he mm. talks about school and how like college is like this huge fucking like it's actually all school is like this huge scam in the way that it's set up, mm. which, you know, little teaser for those who are going to join the book club. But anyway, he was it, the story is saying that they used to just let kids like run around and try things out. So, like, the kid could go run to, you know, someone who cooks for everyone and, like, help cook that day. And then could run somewhere else for, like, the person who, like, makes clothes for everybody and, like, try that out the next day. And, like, go run around with the person who grows the food and try that out. And it wasn't this fucking deal where you have to get, like, an unpaid internship and, like, you know, <laughs> not even. a fucking racket. I know. <laughs> not even actually do the job that you're interested in for free, (laughs) but you can just like, if we had this structure, if we had more open stuff, you could just go, you could be a a kid or an adult who's just like, you know what? I've always been kind of interested in gardening. I'm going to go just like go to a farm Mm -hmm. and, and just show up and like, see what's up. We could just have this open society because people will seek out shit that they're good at and that they're interested in. They will, they can't, we can't help it. It's actually part of how we're designed that we want to find the thing that we like. And for some of us, we like a lot of different things. So we might float around and do a bunch of different stuff, but there's hardly anybody who would literally not do anything. Right. And to that person, I say, so what? Right. That's fine. Yeah. We have way overestimated how important work is and how much value it actually has in general. And what it actually says about a person. Like even that word lazy is just so ugly. It's such an ugly word. I got called lazy last night. (laughs) My continuing (laughs) fucking happy hour saga. Um, Some kid asked me like, what do you, what's on your bucket list? And I was like, that's kind of a fun question. I'll play. And I was like, I want to write a sci-fi trilogy. I want to write sci-fi novels. I have these ideas and I want to write like 
like I want to write a lot, but I would love to write like a trilogy that really says something. And he's like, oh, so you must be writing short stories and drafting stuff and like writing all the time right now, right? And I said, no, actually I'm not. I don't have the time and energy for that. And he's like, that just sounds lazy to me. (sighs) And just what an ugly word. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm not lazy. First of all, like look at Callie and I. We're two people who are not in ideal health. We don't have unlimited resources. You know, we have these full-time jobs that drain the shit out of us. And yet we show up here every week because we fucking love it. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people like us. I know so many people who have a side hustle who are trying so hard. So you're telling me that if people had money to support themselves, that they would suddenly be like, oh, no. That passionate thing that I did even when I was fucking sick or even when I was so tired or even when I had to fit it in between all this other shit. I'm just not going to do that anymore now that I could do it without killing myself. Come on. Do you know how many Monday nights after working a full day of work, I've been editing this episode at 1 a.m. in the morning? Because oh, yeah. So we post it on time the next day and Nicole's right there, right in the show notes. Yep. And you're telling me I wouldn't want to do those things if I didn't have to work the entire day at a job I didn't want to do? Come on. To do the thing I do want to do? No. Come on. Come on. We all have things that we're passionate about. So this idea that like we know we would do things, but we think nobody else around us would makes no sense. I know. (laughs) I know. And yeah, there would probably be some people. I know some people who don't like have a passion I would argue probably a lot of that is lack of exposure yeah and like just anyway and just just go on a whole yeah everything well and just like and also how we breed people to be apathetic and we tell people certain things don't have value and so they don't even like get the chance to anyway but fine so we have some people who don't do anything who fucking cares that's okay that's actually okay I'm so frustrated by the fact that our society is okay with making things much worse or being a barrier to making things better for the vast majority of people just to fuck over an indeterminate amount of small group of people. Yeah. This you know? hypothetical minority. Like we can't have that. We wel- don't even actually know would exist anyway. Right. We can't have welfare because a couple of people will still, you know, w- blow the money on drugs. And it's like, and yeah. <laughs> okay. So what? Right. Why does these, this small group of people, like, why does them in your eyes, quote unquote, taking advantage of the system, make you feel like it is better to not have a program which is saving the vast majority of people just to prevent these couple people from being able to take advantage. I don't, what is with our priorities? We're so much more concerned with fucking over a few and feeling like we're not letting anything get past us that we make things so much worse for the the majority. It's just a way to um, vilify poor people. It's just, it is because it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) You know, the people who I have known who have been the quote unquote laziest and done the most drugs are kids of people who have money, like lots of money. (laughs) Those people, but we don't vilify them. Right. Right. And why? It's because they're not challenged and they're not ever, they're like the people that I've known they don't have, they don't, they just don't, they don't connect to other people, right? Because they're like above it. Like they've been raised to be like, oh, we're elite and like this family and whatever. And they're not encouraged to like go find passion. They're always expected to like go into the family business or do a certain job or whatever the fuck or marry well, whatever it is. And they're not let out to just be part of the community, part of the greater community and find whatever it is that they like doing right. and they're and they grow up knowing like this money's here so it's fine but i have all these expectations on me and that's it and yet we don't like look at that and think that that's like disgusting and like we should do everything as a society to avoid that but yet we take people who like poor people oh my god I'm just telling you, like, I used to work three fucking jobs 80 hours a week. 
They work so much harder than they work anyone so else. So fucking hard. And most people, like you said, like that guy said, most people, if you ask them, they know what they want to do. They do. And that's how it was with some of my, like, quote unquote, lazy, druggy, fucking rich friends. It's like they did actually know what they wanted to do, but they were, were told when they were young that that was not an option. And then they just, like, lost their way and were like, fuck it. Yep. Nothing fucking matters. And this is what happens when we have elite people separated from the rest of society. And then the rest of us in the middle vilify the people at the bottom Mm -hmm. and also separate ourselves from them. So we have these three segments of society that are just not treating each other like humans and not interacting and not working towards a greater good together. It's a fucking mess. It is. And with all the wealth that's generated... In this country. So like we talk a lot about, you know, CEOs and how much their salaries are and how much corporations make. But even people like celebrities, like the fact that there are people like actors and actresses that, you know, get paid a million dollars per episode of a show, a million dollars per episode. Like you're telling me that that person works a million times harder than a poor person? Right. No, definitely not. The fuck? And also, it proves that, like, that person... I mean, there's a lot we could say, but, like, if you made a million dollars per episode, and this idea that if you got, like, any amount of money that would take care of you, you would just stop doing anything. Like, after one episode, why wouldn't they be like, I'm done? Right. Right. Or like after that show's over, never do anything again. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that. Right. We always see these people. They love acting. It's what they want to do. So you see them in movies and you see them on other shows and like they keep acting, you know, and like I was saying, I think for some of them, maybe they have to because that money wasn't managed very well, (laughs) whatever. Right. But, but that's, we just don't see it. You don't see a CEO who makes ridiculous money be like do it for two years and be like okay i'm good i don't need to work for like a while so i'm just gonna peace out no they usually drop dead in their jobs Mm -hmm. because people generally want to have a thing they like having a thing and this is just saying hey everyone you can not die while you go find the thing that you want to do yeah and also for some of you if that thing is doing nothing fine just don't hurt anybody right we're fine So none of this is to say that there aren't jobs that would still need to get done that people would have to do that maybe they wouldn't love. Because we hear that a lot too. Like, well, not everyone's going to be able to like follow their passions. Like we still need people that are going to do these shitty jobs. And it's like, yeah, okay, maybe. But they certainly don't need to be doing 40 hours of that a week. No. If we had collaborative societies where we recognize that every person deserves to be cared for and have their needs met and that having a well-functioning, well-running society means caring for one another and working towards the common goals, the common good, then yeah, like maybe we divvy up some of these jobs and responsibilities that automation hasn't been able to take over And that we need people to do. But we don't make it like there are class of people that do these shitty jobs that are now like on the outs of society, you know? Absolutely. You know, like garbage men, right? Mm -hmm. We all look down on garbage men. And maybe automation can take over garbage pickup. I don't know. But say it can't. Okay. Then we job share and we realize that like that's a thing society needs but we're not going to expect someone to do that at 40 hours a week and that is literally who they are as a person you know like we just we figure this stuff out yeah there has to be a lot of destigmatizing jobs and creating there has to be like an equalizing of stuff and realizing that these services these public services should be taken care of by the public right You know, we should all, it should become a community effort that we all chip in. Um, Just like, you know, a lot of people have, if someone cooks dinner, the other person does the dishes. We need that like as a society. Yeah. You know, and I think that that would actually be a great, 
I love that you brought up that example for something like this. <laughs> That's such a good, like, right? Yeah, example. Because we've all been, we know how that works. You yeah, know, we you all live in that. a household, yeah. and you're like, okay, you cooked, I'll do dishes, right? And, and you take out the trash, and then I'll vacuum. Exactly, <laughs> and and that's part of it too. Like the community can figure out because um, I certainly like I have certain j- chores that I really don't mind doing, mm-hmm. and then I have ones I fucking hate. Yeah, and then there's ones that are meh. They're like in the middle, and I have been in relationships where it's like. The other person always takes out the trash, just for an example. And I always vacuum Mm -hmm. because that works for us, you know, because I fucking hate taking out the trash, for an example. I actually hate cleaning the bathtub. I think I've talked about this at length, but I can't stand cleaning the bathroom. (laughs) So, like, I had a roommate, and she she kind of resented it a bit, but we never – I didn't have very good communication back then. We should have talked about it. (laughs) Well, like, she would always clean the bathroom because, A, it was more of a priority to her. Like, she needed it clean more often. Mm. And, B, like, I just fucking hated doing it. But then there was other stuff that I did that I didn't mind doing. And I think as a society – it would either be like, oh, we all pitch in on these tasks, or we'd be like, hey, there's people who don't mind doing this thing that needs to get done. It gives them a feeling of contributing to their community, and maybe they don't have other skills. Maybe they do, and they just d- really don't mind doing this work, whatever it is. But we would figure it out as a community, and each community could figure it out for themselves. We need to have more trust. Yeah, We just need to think collaboratively. Okay. We need to think like each area is a community and then those people have a vested interest in their community being the best that it can be and taking care of the needs of everyone in it and when you just fucking trust people to do that they actually figure it out how do you all think we got here right like how do you think we got here before there were paychecks and like all this shit hanging over our heads like this is how we became human beings Right. Is working this way and taking care of each other. We used to be nomadic tribes. Like we've had this shit figured out. We managed to eat. We managed to raise children. We managed to have shelter. Like we managed to do this before we had the systems we have now. So it's weird to me that we think like that, that, that we would just dissolve into chaos and like garbage everywhere and fires burning and like people starving. And like, we don't think that we just as humans would like figure it out and take care of each other. Well, and that there would be like violence and crime and (sighs) you know, all of this stuff. And it's like, but what we find is the opposite. Like study after study shows that it's the opposite when people are cared for, when they have their basic needs met. Crime goes down. We're social creatures. Violence goes down. By our very nature, we're we're programmed to want to take care of the community because that's what's safe for us in our su- survival. Right. And a lot of that's being overridden by fucking toxic masculinity and the goddamn fucking patriarchy and fucking white supremacy and this colonial mindset we're all in and corporate pro- fucking profit and all this other shit is what's like making you know in like game of thrones <laughs> that yes. fucking show yes girl <laughs> i'm sure i lost like half the audience right there <laughs> um but you know what i mean like like that the even the way we're acting is not natural to us and mm. this would help get us back towards a more natural state of where we can connect with each other and do this community building our com- our social networks are too big now mm-hmm. and i want to you know, there's this whole idea of thinking as a global community, and I think for sure. But I think a lot of what this would do is allow us to become more localized as well, which is what we need. Mm-hmm. Humans thrive better when they have about 150 social contacts, like, you know, people that they connect with in some way, like in real life. And um, that's part of why social media is so taxing for us, because now we have way more than our brain was built to handle. And it's just exhausting. And actually... But also not getting enough in person. Right. I was going to say, it actually has this weird isolating effect on us. So imagine if we all had money to live and our priority was to make sure that people in our community were good and that the things that needed to be done within our community were happening... All of a sudden now we get to focus back down into our neighbors. I don't fucking know my neighbors. I don't want to know those people. But it's because I live in this world that's so fucking exhausting to me. Yeah. You know, imagine like caring who your neighbors are and caring about the people in your community and caring about the things that need to be done there. And as a community, making decisions together with everyone's best interest in mind. Yep. 
we could finally come back down to how we're built to naturally thrive, which is in small localized communities that are working towards common goals. Everything you just said is just heart emoji. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and I just want to add to that, that yes, I think toxic masculinity and the patriarchy and white supremacy and all these things are adding to the problems, but I truly, truly believe that capitalism is at the heart of so many of our problems. I mean, and it's, yes. and it's not just because of the, the expectation that you're always going to have profits and that it's ruining the environment and all of these things. It's the fact that we are, you know, at its core, it's a competitive system. It's a system. It's an individualistic. It's an individualistic yeah. system that is training us from birth to believe in survival of the fittest. We don't need to act that way. We produce more goods, more money, more food, more shelter then we need, we can care for literally everyone. So why are we stepping all over each other and looking the other way when people are going hungry, when they're dying of diseases and ailments that we literally have the technology and resources to cure, when they're dying from food shortages, from not having clean water, from being forced to like be homeless and be subjected to weather? because capitalism like because we're growing up to think that like not all of us are gonna make it not yeah not all of us can make it in the system so I don't give a fuck about you I'm only gonna care for me and mine mm -hmm. it's it's unnatural and it perpetuates this idea that we all have an equal chance at making it yeah so when we don't it's our own fault Yes. Even though we know, I mean, you just can look around and see that that's just provably untrue. Capitalism yeah. perpetuates that fucking bootstrap ideal. Yeah. So I think a lot of the violence and crime, you know, that we see so much of that would go away if we were not living in a system that made people feel like they had to fight for survival. Right. Fight over the basic needs to live. Can you Absolutely. imagine how radically different we would think and feel and interact with each other if there, that competition no longer existed between us? And absolutely. I mean, like the number one cause for addiction is fucking loneliness. Yeah. So you take people and then put them in a community that's now collaborating and working together and they have a place in it. They have something they can do to contribute. Mm -hmm. It's going to solve their problem. And I would argue a lot of violence is also very similar. I think there's a lot of violence that happens based on money, like armed robbery, you know, whatever shit like that. Um, also tied to addiction. I mean, you're solving a lot of the causes of violence right there by just providing funding to live and community to live in. Right. When people feel connected, when they feel like they have a place and they have people who care about them and they have something they like doing that other people see and appreciate, like, that solves most of the causes of a lot of fucking shit. Yeah. A lot of shit. You know, I um, I get so frustrated when people are opposed to having these kinds of conversations and analyzing how bad capitalism is. And the, the arguments that they make against a universal basic income, you know, like we touched on earlier, the laziness and the fact that people are going to be on drugs and alcohol and they're going to, you know, eat themselves to death and, and sit on the couch and never exercise. Just all of these things, right? It's like mm -hmm. all of these sins that we are only kept from committing because work keeps us distracted, right? Right. But... We're already, we have those problems now. Yes. Like I get so frustrated that people think that like those things will happen if we have, if we take away the incentive for people to want to work, which we wouldn't be doing with a universal basic income as we've explained, but that's what people think, right? If you 
take away the incentive for people to work to survive, then you're going to have all of these problems. But all of those problems exist today because of capitalism. Most of the people I work with self-medicate with drugs, alcohol, food, and TV. Yes. And video games. Yes. Which is my drug of choice. We're in this. We're already in the problem. Yes. And it's a lot of people who are working who have it because they don't want to be fucking doing what they're doing. Because I the took two weeks off. Because exhausting them. Exactly. I took two weeks off last year. I took four days off after London. I just had a long weekend. Every time I have a good chunk of time to myself where I don't have to worry about money because it's a paid vacation, right? And I still have my like salary coming in. I clean my house. And I make really good food and I fucking do yoga or go for a walk or do something to like move my body in a way that feels really nice every day. And I get out in the sunshine and then I'm like, oh, fuck this book I wanted to read. And I read a fucking book. And then I have all these ideas for the show and I'm like annoying the shit out of Callie because I'm like, oh, and what about this? And what about this? I'm sending her all these links. I'm like, I'm thinking about this. And like, (laughs) I reach out to all these people to schedule interviews and I just do all the shit. I start thinking about writing or I like write a blog post or I do... I'm not laying on my couch, just, you know, numbing my side. I mean, maybe for the first couple of days, but then after, once I start feeling better, I'm like, oh, like I wake up and I like start living again. Mm-hmm. And then day one, when I'm back to work without fail, I can't sleep the night before because I'm stressed out about having to go back to work. And then day one back to work, I'm back to these numbing behaviors immediately yep. because I don't want to do it. Or I don't want to do it on their schedule or whatever. I don't hate the actual work that I do. I actually even like some of it a lot, but it's having to do it on a certain schedule and it's having to know that I have to do it. I have no other option, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. We already are struggling with all of these problems in society. Right now in the United States, we're in this really awful opioid crisis. Yes. You know? I was telling Callie, um, New Hampshire has a really, really bad drug problem. And it's yeah. there's a lot of places in New Hampshire that don't have any industry. There's really no jobs. There's small little towns that people just fucking do drugs because they don't have anything else to do. Yeah. And we're seeing that across so many cities in the United States right now because of that. People are terrified. They don't have the money. They, yeah, they're poor and they don't see a way out. Their jobs are going away. They're seeing their paychecks get smaller and smaller while wealth is being accumulated at the top. It's like no mobility. There's no opportunities in an area like that. You don't, that's what I was saying before about like prisons and all this other shit. Like you grow up poor, you're basically told you, or you just know you don't have options. Yeah. And when you are in a bad situation with no way out, no one is showing you a way out from it. You're going to fucking do drugs. Mm -hmm. You're going to fucking like become violent. You're going to do because you're being told that your entire life is basically going to be painful and then you're going to fucking die and nobody's going to care because you weren't a contributing member of society. Do you know what that does to you? God, that's painful. And that's painful just to hear it. Right. Let alone the people who live it. Can you imagine living that way? No. Like that's your lived experience. That's what I'm talking about. Like my friends that I've had that they had teachers telling them like, you'll never amount to anything. You're a drain on society. You're a waste. What do you think happens to a kid like that? Do you think they're like, I'm going to prove you wrong? Yes, yeah, sometimes. And then those are usually the asshole CEOs who are being fucking toxic and, you know, just ugh, oppressive and horrible. Because now they've got this, like, fucking grudge and they're trying to, like, prove something their entire lives. Like, that never goes away because that cuts so deep. Mm -hmm. Or you go the other way and you're like, fine, I'll give up then. I don't fucking care. And you become hurt in this way that's very self-destructive and it just eats at you. And then that's when you're like, I'm going to do some drugs because I want to feel better or I'm going to drink or I'm going to, like, what the fuck ever. Mm -hmm. But when you have a whole person who's healthy, who has support. And by healthy, I just mean like has food, has health care. Mm-hmm. That most of the time you're going to have someone who's pretty okay. 
the vast majority of the time. The vast majority of the time. Yep. You're not going to take that situation and then have somebody who's going to be committing armed robbery for the most part. (laughs) We... (laughs) We have so much empathy towards ourselves whenever we go through something. And I know that that's just how humans are, obviously. Like, we're we're going to understand our circumstances way better than we can someone else's. But it's <laughs> it's really annoying to me that we can have little things. And I don't mean to sound uh, dismissive, but like, just follow me for a minute. Like we have these things that happen to us that in the grand scheme of things are, are not always that bad. And we can have empathy and understand why even with circumstances that weren't terrible, we could understand why we acted out poorly. Mm. But then we look at other people who have suffered truly horrendous conditions and have the odds completely stacked against them. And we go, why can't they get themselves out of it? Oh like, why do they, why do they act that way? Why, if you grow up in a neighborhood where there's literally no option for you and the only place you can get affection is like the gang that lives mm-hmm. in your neighborhood. And yet we look down on people. Yeah. You know, I grew up thinking like, if that's the only like place that you're going to get love, I completely understand why people join gangs. Absolutely. You know? Again, gangs are just a community. Yes. But based on mm-hmm. criminal activity. Right. But at the heart of them. And it's about surviving with each other. Right. They're doing what they can to try to survive. And I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm all like pro criminal activity <laughs> or anything. But it's like, no, I do it's think just, that we need to understand and have empathy. Again, they're human. Yeah. And we need to humanize everybody. Yeah. That should be our biggest goal in life is to see everyone as a human because we can't fix any fucking problems when we're just putting people in like these non-person categories Mm -hmm. where we can just write them off and like boil them down to this one characteristic right like violent like they're just violent they're thugs right that fucking word that's what it means is like these are throwaway people that i don't have to care about because i know that all they are are violent criminals yeah but they're not they're people who grew up in a certain situation they're people who came together because they were lacking first of all financial stability because that's what gangs do too. They provide you with a way to make an income. Mm-hmm. They provide you with people who like valid or not care about, you know, like they, pro- they tell you like, we care about you. You're part of our family. They give you a job to do. They teach you how to do that job. I mean, what does this sound like? What everyone fucking wants that we can provide <laughs> by just giving everyone that Instead of making them have to go find it in these certain situations. Yeah. A lot of cults are like that too. You yeah. get a place in the cult and you get a job to do and you're given family and you're told like, we're your people. We're here. We're going to take care of you and you have a place in this community and this place looks like this. Yeah. Why can't we just do that without having people <laughs> have to go into situations that are so unhealthy? I don't know. I have such a silly, like, white girl example that <laughs> Do tell. it's probably inappropriate to share Are at this point. Are you going to use the white girl voice? No. <laughs> um, but this is kind of what I was hinting at, like, with what I was trying to say a couple of minutes ago. So when I was in, and, like, just know that I realize how ridiculous this is in comparison to the things that we're talking about, but I feel like it does paint a picture that most people can understand, especially people that come from a place of privilege, right? Yeah. So when I was in high school, um, when I came back to the start of my senior year, a couple people who had not liked me, um, spread a bunch of really shitty rumors Mm. about me. And, um, I was such, I, as you all know, I had gone through like a really bad time with my family and going through some really bad, like emotional abuse. And this was very surprising to me because I was a really good kid. You know, I mean, I was a teenager, so I like broke some rules just like everybody. But like I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. Like, you know, I didn't party, do drugs or have sex, anything like that. Right. I was like a pretty good kid who got pretty decent grades and before this. And then um, (laughs) I came back to school after going through this whole fucking terrible thing with my family and it's a bunch of 
asshole teenagers had spread rumors about me that like I don't even know where they got this stuff but that I was off like drinking and doing drugs and like banging all these like older like college dudes or something like I I just which first of all that sounds like a great summer right (laughs) like that I became this like like, what party girl but yeah I know and I was like not first of all not doing any of those things well and it's kind of ironic considering the abuse you were suffering that summer right Yeah, so I'm trying how to, like, figure out how I'm going to have a roof over my head and how I'm going to continue going to high school. And I come back and people think that I became, like, Paris Hilton or something. Like, just fucking being a party girl. Not that there's anything wrong with party girls, but it was clearly not me. And you know what I did? I was... I heard these rumors very early on it was like such a made for tv moment because i was sitting in class and like all these people were looking at me and then got really quiet and it's like that moment you're like what Mm -hmm. what just happened like you'd walk into a room and people would be quiet all of a sudden such a bad feeling and i finally like someone who was like kind of a acquaintance slash friend like didn't really know them that well they pulled me aside and they were like um, there's all these rumors about you and like told me all this stuff. And I just kind of snapped. Like I was just like, mm. all right, cool. Like that's what people think about me after I've done, I've worked so hard to like not do bad things. Like I just went through this terrible thing with my family and yet people are just going to spread rumors even when I've done nothing to like spark them, you know? And I was like, fine. I literally just don't care anymore. I ended up, um, I almost not ended up almost not passing my senior year of high school because I ditched like 80% of my entire senior year. I turned 18 at the start of my senior year, (laughs) which means you can now sign yourself out and they can't call your parents because you're (laughs) a legal adult. And I took full advantage (laughs) of that policy. In fact, a couple of the security guards I was like friends with and they would just be like seeing, I would like show up at third period and then like leave after lunch and miss like the last two periods of the day. Like they just saw me coming and going at all days, you know, all times during the day. So if someone like me who can have something so small happen to them and not to like discount like when, I mean, bullying is. It's, it's not a small thing. It's I don't mean to thing. minimize that. But I mean, like, for someone who was relatively right. safe at that point and cared for. Well, yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I'm like, also, your situation was horrible. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. For... Yes. But I know what I mean. You had a house. Yeah. I was through most of the ma- yeah, ba- main through. issues with mm-hmm. my parents. I was no longer quite in, like, as uncertain terms about, like, where I was going to be living and stuff. Uh, Most of that had kind of settled down. So if someone like me can have something like that happen, where just because like rumors were spread about me, which were just patently untrue and had no bearing on anything, like nothing was at risk at that point besides like, again, being made fun of at school, which is not a small thing, but also not anything that was like critical to Mm -hmm. my survival. And I can have such an extreme reaction where I like threw away my entire last year of senior year and almost didn't pass school as someone who used to be an extremely good student and basically like fucked myself out of getting into college, any of that. Then like how, and I think most people would kind of understand that whole attitude of like, oh, Mm -hmm. this is the shit you're going to say about me. Well then fuck caring because clearly it doesn't get me anywhere Absolutely, like I got all the negative consequences without any of the fun of actually doing any of that stuff (laughs) so how can we not understand people that like get labeled and like thrown out of society with very real dangerous life-threatening consequences Mm -hmm. and we look at them like well why can't they just get it together right (laughs) Well, I told you it's like at work where I had that meeting and another small kind of white girl example, but (laughs) I had that meeting and the um, president was talking about, oh, you know, we did this manager's meeting and like it came to light that we need to change the culture so that it's not a like finding the person to blame when something goes wrong. We need to, as a company, have success and as a company have failure. 
Mm. You know, so like when something goes great, it's because of all of us collectively. And when something goes wrong, it's because of all of us collectively. Like there needs to stop being this like find who did it, find who's to blame. He was like, but, you know, at the same time. And I'm like, (sighs) okay, okay. (laughs) But he was like, at the same time, like you control your attitude like if you can control nope. nothing else no. you control your work ethic and Ugh. your attitude and like if you show up every day he's like I don't care if you have a terrible manager I don't care if like what is happening like you can show up every day and give 110 percent and then that's like your character like that's you and that's every employee should be doing that for themselves and I was like <sighs> I get like such strong reactions to that because I've lived in that for so long exactly that kind of like mentally abusive like shit of just like it's everything everything's on you you just have to put a smile on your face and there's like no justification for being in like shitty situations that's meant to like fucking break us down right but any failure is still on you it's totally on you No, exactly. Like even saying that, like, I don't care if you have like a crap manager and it's like, but do you understand that's the person who's controlling my career? My development probably has a ton of input on if I get a raise or not, what work I'm doing. They can micromanage me if they want to. They can give me a bad review. They can make every single day that I'm at work hell. Yep. And you're telling me that there's no excuse for that impacting my mental health which is my quote unquote attitude. I love how attitude is this word that somehow you're supposed to have a good one that isn't impacted by your fucking mental health. Right. Right. Yep. Like, okay. So if I'm depressed because this job fucking blows and all of you are assholes, (laughs) then that's me having a bad attitude. People should say that more. Oh my God. That something fucking blows. Isn't that great? It's a classic. (laughs) I'm bringing it back. Good, I just should. decided. Um, you said it was so much feeling. Yeah. Like it was just good. It just blows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like instead of that being like, oh, I have a mental health issue because this situation is actually abusive and breaking me down. No, I have a bad attitude. Right. <laughs> it's just more fucking ableism. Everything about corporate culture is fucking ableism. Yeah. But exactly. It's just this idea that like, at, like... You can take it from such small things and then blow it up and think if that was your entire fucking life and everyone in it treated you that way. Like, why? How do you think you turn out? What do you think you'd be doing? Right. And yeah, of course, there's some people out there who like pulled up their fucking bootstraps and fucking made it. But like, good on them. But that's not how most humans respond to those situations. Well, why should our expectations be that high? Yeah. Why should it be like... (laughs) Oh, you have to overcome every single thing we're going to throw at you as a society for us to think you have any value at all. But like, also there's other people who won't have to do that. Right. (laughs) Okay, cool. And then no matter what you do, you always carry this stain, this Mm -hmm. like, you know, poverty stain. Like it never goes away. I suffer from it all the time feeling it. And I suffer from things like people asking about my family and having to decide if I admit that I don't have one and like getting into that whole conversation or trying to fake it through a couple questions about the holidays without actually disclosing anything. I mean, that shit sticks with you. It lingers. So even when you pull up your bootstraps and you make it, you never get out of that because that stuff is still by society deemed like, you know, lower class and undesirable and so you just have this fucking insecurity all the time and that insecurity can still manifest in addiction mental health issues etc 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 i'm probably gonna misquote this but i saw something a while back that i fucking loved Um, you know, that old expression sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. I saw something like that, but then added the, this part that said like, but we'll leave like deep emotional scars that last for a lifetime or something. And I was like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Like words have deep lasting impact. Like circumstances that we put people through have deep lasting impact on the rest of your life. Like not that you can't overcome these things, but it's, it's a lot of them are still there. Yeah. 
You, you know? get close to a lot of powerful people who are like self-made and they have some fucking issues because <laughs> that shit doesn't go away. Right. And when you have to spend your life like proving and like overcoming that stuff, it can become yeah. like this thing that you carry around mm-hmm. when you define yourself by defying an identity that you didn't give yourself. It kind of becomes your identity in this weird way. Yeah. Right. Well, and like you, the opposite of that becomes your fucking identity. And then you're still not really being yourself. No. Plus, you're literally tokenized for the rest of your life now. Oh, my God. Right? Yes. I mean, even if you do become a big success, what are people going to talk about you? What a big success you are. And also the fact that you, like, <laughs> overcame all of these circumstances. Like fucking rich people being like, he was homeless once. Isn't that precious? Right. Now he's so successful. Well, and whenever just, like, you see interviews about people that have like, quote unquote, made it, mm. it's, they never let them forget that that's a part of their identity. Yeah. It's like, you're not interesting unless you're constantly also reminding us that you like came from nothing. Oh my God. So they can never actually shed that identity. Right. It they just do becomes it permanently such... attached to them. Oh yeah. So yeah. So part of their self-assigned identity is defying that identity but it's like why does this matter in the first place just go live your life it's okay right i mean but i get it right um it's also like fucking celebrity interviews when they're like george clooney before you're in your first movie you were a waiter And then everyone laughs because that's funny that like someone famous once did a normal job that everyone does you know But it's just like that, like, oh, can you believe he was like a real person once? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I can. Because like, what is he supposed to be like out of the womb and immediately receiving an Oscar? It's just so fucking weird. Thank you for (laughs) miming to me too. The baby coming out of the vagina and into someone's hands and then like lifting your hand up like this was the fucking Lion King in the little stewed. Yes, y'all. I just had a hypothetical <laughs> baby for Callie's <laughs> enjoyment. This is, why, this is why we were joking about needing a YouTube channel. I know. These are At the things some people point, miss. That's going to be a Patreon reward is a live stream of us taping. Oh, God. Because, y'all, it's guaranteed added value. I promise. Um, but, yeah, but you know what I mean? Or, like, oh, like, I've, I've heard so many, like, oh, this actor used to be homeless or, uh, oh, how many times have you heard that about Jewel? Right? Yeah. And it's like, let her fucking live her life. Okay? <laughs> like, there's nothing shameful about being homeless, but that's not how you're talking about it. Right. You're talking about it like, you got to remind that bitch that once she did not have a home, and isn't it so wild that now you have money? And it's like, no, it's not wild. That's how weirdly uneven our whole system is. And also just stop making that part of, she can choose if that's part of her identity. Stop choosing it for her. Mm-hmm. Goddamn. Yep. So I hope we've given you a lot of reasons why <laughs> a, a universal basic income is not just like smart, mm-hmm. but also like just ethical. It's like we just cannot continue to live in a society where our values don't communicate that people deserve to have their basic needs cared for. I just, I can't even believe I have to say that, you know, I can't believe that I get in arguments where I see people like arguing against that. Like, how could anyone think that like, it's okay that we let people suffer and or die for not having their basic needs met because they can't generate profit or profit in the way we want them to generate profit. Mm-hmm. Girl, preach. I I mean, seriously, like what the fuck is wrong with the world that that has to be said? <laughs> I think you just broke yourself. I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, and I know this is like not an appropriate thing to say, but it's like that scene in Zoolander where the guy was like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Like, that's how I feel sometimes when it comes to this conversation. It's like, I don't know how to meet someone in the middle who won't at least come to the table agreeing that people shouldn't have to die because they don't have food. Like, what do I say to you? 
you. That's how I felt last night when that dude was like, I'm challenging your ideology. And I was like, fuck that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, we could have debates about how we should implement UBI mm -hmm. or how that how society would work. But it's like, I don't know. Like, how do we even start this conversation with people who when just... When we can't all agree, people shouldn't starve to death. Right. Or that people, because they can't afford health care, should die of curable ailments. Oh, my God. I mean, seriously. I mean, seriously. There are people that are dying. I mean, I said last week there was, what it, what was the statistic? Like over 10,000 people had died mm -hmm. just last year waiting for their benefits to come through. They had benefits. They were just waiting for them to come through because it took too long. <laughs> Can you imagine if that was someone you loved and oh. you watched them die? waiting for their bent and there's probably people listening who like have actually had that experience yeah but like i don't see how people can't make it real for themselves and people don't even know those facts they, they don't even know that they don't yeah. care yeah they're just making judgments based on their extremely limited view of the world and their extremely limited experience of the world yep so a universal basic income we proved i think um, we presented, or I should say, we presented a lot of information that shows that it's financially possible. It's not pie in the sky, like so many people would have you believe. We generate so much wealth and just obscene profit for so few, while so many go without, that I think it's not unreasonable to say, like, everybody gets the benefit and we come together and figure out what the minimum needs to be so that people can live decent lives. You know, I don't want people living in poverty like they no. see like communism did, right? Where like everybody was poor. Like that's not the idea. The idea is you come up with a reasonable figure <laughs> that people can live off of so that even if they didn't earn income on top of that, they were cared for and not having to struggle. And then if people choose to get jobs and earn income on top of that, that you just tax that progressively. Mm -hmm. So everything you're earning on top of what the bare minimum, you know, the universal income is, is taxed. And you just keep increasing the tax rate the more money you fucking earn on top of the basic income. So that you don't have people that are making a million dollars per episode. Per fucking episode! Or a CEO that's making $15 million when their oh workers God. make $50. 50000 Sorry. Because <laughs> I was like, it's not $50 million. No. <laughs> Cents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, sometimes. You know, you yeah. don't have wealth that's like accumulating at the top. You tax it progressively to pay yeah. for the benefits of everyone else. I mean, else. I'm sorry. Yes, it should be impossible for yes. people to be wealthy like extremely wealthy i'm yes. sorry i agree and we can fight about it not you and i because i know <laughs> got your back but exactly like it should be impossible it should hit a point where it is impossible yeah to make just a amounts of money that give you power over other people yes and people think that that's and unfair encourage. there's no way to make tons of money where you're not exploiting someone <laughs> yes <laughs> we're laughing because i just <laughs> i pulled in nicole and yeah. i like did this big you gesture did. right that's, tapped that's what my I do. No nose and pointed at her oh. but um yes exactly people that are rich are not generating <laughs> this profits on their own just out of yeah. the universe without benefiting off the labor of anyone else people that are making money are because they're taking that money from other people that are equally as responsible if not more so for producing it thank you <laughs> you think the actress or actor who's <laughs> making like or or musician who yep. you know is making 20 million dollars or something a year from concerts you're telling me that they could make 20 million and yet 
all of the support people that are involved in getting that person where they need to go, to setting up the venues, to, Mm -hmm. you know, doing the production, to producing the album. You're telling me all of those people don't deserve a bigger cut about the money that that musician is making. That's what people don't understand. It's like the workers are equally responsible for generating the profit and yet they're getting such a small piece of it well that's a great example because like and they think it's unfair because we're talking about taking from the rich and it's like y'all are stealing from us not the other way around right you didn't generate this in a bubble by yourself it's not about taking (laughs) from the rich it's to have the rich stop taking from us fucking thank you (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) This episode, I love it. It's been like so up and down. It's like we kind of mellow out and then we go like, We're like nope, back we up. rile ourselves yep. right back, right back up there. <laughs> I love it. So we hope that all of this has painted the picture of why a universal basic income is not extreme, why it's actually reasonable, and I would argue a very necessary conversation. As we talked about in our last week's episode, a huge percent, like half, if not more, of the jobs currently could be lost to automation. So this isn't just like a nice thing that we should be thinking about. Like we literally have to figure something out because within the next couple of decades, our current system is no longer going to work. Yeah. Unless you're okay with, you know, 50% or more of the people not having any income. And then the corporations who have benefited from this automation having even more of the wealth yep. and having an even wider gap, <laughs> right? which I'm not okay with. No. <laughs> I certainly hope no one listening by now is okay with it. Yeah. It's just not. It, yeah. Yeah. We've gone on about it, but it's just not realistic. And so to say that a proposed solution is not realistic is just ridiculous to me right I can't wrap my brain around it and you know facts and figures are important some people need them so I don't begrudge anyone who uses them Mm -hmm. but I would just really implore you all that if you're having conversations like this or about you know these type of ideas or ideologies or really anything that's like a moral or ethical stance that you're taking that you make sure to not lose that in the conversation. We need to be educating out of the moral stance using the tools that we need to communicate effectively. But like, I don't know. I just don't want to see people start like talking about UBI only in the way that it like makes financial sense. It's like have your facts, but also be like, But the line in the sand is Mm -hmm. that I don't think anyone should be starving or homeless. Like, let's work from that point. Yeah. Well, it's like what we've been saying about veganism. Yeah. I mean, you can tackle, you can get a lot of people on your side if you talk about health and you talk about the environment and you have all these facts and figures and studies to back you up, but you still are not actually promoting the animal liberation agenda, which is should be at the heart of someone who is truly practicing veganism Mm -hmm. and it's the same here like yes of course we need facts and figures like someone's gonna have to figure this out at some point we're gonna have to crunch the numbers but but at the heart of it we're not actually solving anything if we're not doing this because we don't want people dying because they don't have money Mm -hmm. or having painful difficult lives and not you know living a real life because just because they don't have money Right. Like that's got to be the heart of the solution. Otherwise, the solution is going to lack heart. And then we're just going to end up having different problems that are coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to have a UBI that has some kind of income requirement that just basically perpetuates the same problems we have with welfare right now. Yep. (laughs) God damn it. I know. So we hope um, these last two episodes have been um, inspiring and Mm -hmm. educational and have really helped tackle, you know, this really big topic and that um, just know that it's the start of a conversation, you know? Absolutely. So, um, all right, y'all. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.